Um, so hi everybody, my name is Nani. I use the and she pronouns. I am the Justice Involved Advocacy Coordinator at the Connecticut Alliance Student Sexual Violence. I'm really excited to do this uh, training with you all and think about the ways that survivors are criminalized, um, which is to say like punished by the criminal legal system for surviving sexual violence. Um, all of this is like the materials that we're working through today are adapted from survived and punished criminal criminalizing survival curriculum. Um, and they're against punishment curriculum and it was originally created by Hai Jin Shin. So shout out to those folks who like have been doing incredible work for so long and I'm really excited to like bring this perspective to all of you. The Connecticut Alliance to End Sexual Violence is a statewide coalition. Uh, we support the nine member agencies who do the direct service um, of supporting survivors of sexual violence. And we offer a bunch of different types of free and confidential, confidential services. Throughout this training or the next hour or so, um, we're definitely gonna be talking about some pretty difficult topics. Um, so I encourage all of you to do what it is that makes you feel good and safe in your body. Um, I've tried to put content notes whenever possible, but it, I can't predict um, how things are going to affect you. So. Also, this is being recorded and you have my email, so feel free to just reach out to me if you feel like doing so. You don't have to be 100% in this um, presentation right now. That's not what feels good to you. Um, so our agenda for today, we're gonna do some warm-up exercises and think about Kai Peterson's story. I will go on a little bit of a lecture, which is not my favorite thing to do in the world, but I will have to do it. Um, so I can frame some different ways of how uh, we can understand how survivors are criminalized for the way that they are surviving sexual violence. And we'll do a group activity around May's story and we'll do some breakout rooms and then we'll reconvene together. Cool. Actually, so in order to do this, I would love for a volunteer to read because I'm gonna be talking a lot and I just, I don't wanna hear my own voice. So if someone could volunteer to read this, that would be amazing. You guys, I can't see you. Yeah. So, so, go ahead, Olga. Okay. Thank you. Um, Kai's story, content note, transphobia, rape, murder, incarceration, victim label. Kai Peterson is a black trans man from Georgia. In 2011, Kai was walking home when he was attacked and raped. He tried to fight off his rapist and in the process, killed him in self-defense. His teenage younger brothers found him injured. In a panic, they attempted to cover the incident. The next day, Kai told the police about the attack. They were all arrested and taken to jail. They were charged with armed robbery and first degree murder, and the teens were threatened with being charged as adults. When it became apparent that Kai was injured, the police took him to jail to a clinic where he was examined. The nurse who performed the examination confirmed that Kai had been brutally raped. Yet she said that Kai didn't act like a woman who had been raped. After the examination, Kai received no medical treatment or support for his rape. Instead, he was returned to jail where he sat for nearly a year with no word about his case. He was told by his own public defender that he couldn't use a self-defense argument because he was because he was black and looked stereotypically gay, which already made him seem guilty. An autopsy confirmed that Kai's DNA was found on the dead man's genitals. This evidence, which proves Kai's innocence, was ignored. Kai's case was never never went to trial, and instead, he was pressured into taking a plea deal for 20 years in prison. He has been in prison for six years. Freedom Overground, Survived and Punished, Get Equal, Black and Pink, Snap Call, and Southerners of, on New Ground are organizing for his release. Thank you, Olga. Um, so that's a pretty difficult story. What are folks, is like, how are y'all feeling? What are some immediate thoughts and reactions? I 
anger and frustration. You can type into the box or if you're able to unmute yourself, you can also do that. I saw that Maitland put a angry emoji emoticon. It was frustrating. I am sharing this um, Jamboard that we're all gonna be working on um, in a little bit together. But first, um, what are some of the violences that Kai is experiencing? I'm also seeing in the chat, Daniel Walker said a complete lack of care and respect. Cindy says typical of the injustice system. Olga said that this feels like this is more common than we anticipate, unfortunately. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so what are some of the violences that um, Kai is experiencing? Um, in the chat, Nani, we've got racial discrimination, transphobia, and invasive sexual assault. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Are there all completely true? Are there other types of balances that are coming up with folks right now that they're seeing? bias against incarcerated people. Sure. See if we can get one or two more. And you, you can also get a little bit more specific if that is helpful. Like where is the transphobia coming up? There's also um, a comment that says it's frustrating due to the stigma, lack of empathy or regard for the victim. Mm -hmm. And also uh, trauma that's untreated and untreated physical harm. For sure, untreated physical harm and the trauma that comes from that. Mm -hmm. And uh, poor defense based on bias. Oh, like legal defense probably. Yep. Uh, yeah. Bias for sure. And also um, that the attorneys are pressuring him to take a plea deal, that that's another form of violence. Pressure to take plea deal. Um, where, okay, so this is all true, right? For sure, these Kai's experiencing violences um, from racial discrimination, transphobia, invasive sexual assault, Isaac against incarcerated people, um, a lot of stuff uh, around like the legal system, um, poor legal defense due to bias, the pressure to take a plea deal, stigma, lack of empathy or regard for the victim and untreated physical harm and trauma. And what are the sources of these violences? So where, for example, um, where is, I'm just going to switch to green, so maybe we can delineate some things. Um, the pressure to take a plea deal and a poor legal defense, where is that violence coming from? Where is the source of that violence? I think it's like in the institutions, right? So like within the legal system, um, I was also thinking to like around the medical system and then like not getting the care and the nurse's sort of sentiment there too. For sure. Thank you for also naming the medical system. I thought that particular detail um, in the story was like, especially harmful given that that is one of the first people to, that's supposed to care for a survivor, right? 
We've also got in the chat um, the broken adversarial justice system and that he was assigned a PD, which I'm guessing means public defender, um, who is not representing his best interests necessarily. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, could we name a couple of sources of where the transphobia and racial discrimination is coming from? Where is that coming from? This is the just a, system. oh, sorry, Lindsay, go ahead. Oh, that's okay. The, the medical system, the nurse who performed the exam. Mm -hmm. There's also a comment, not to that specific question, but just that the legal system um, has given him a voice, not his own, and RJ would give him con control. And then and these RJ. are systemic problems. Yeah, and that these are systemic problems for sure. Systemic problems. I do not know how to spell that word right now. Sorry. I think I got it right. Um, yeah, for sure. All of these things are true. Uh, and I think also, like, even I'm, as I'm trying to, like, arrange this jam board in a way that makes sense, like, these harms are, they come from the legal system, they're coming from the medical system, like, the transphobia is not just, like, oh, the like, legal system hurt me in this way. It's also the medical system. It's also, I mean, I mean, I think maybe the more obvious one is, like, literally the, the rapist himself um, is causing lots of harm. Um, yeah, so we're seeing that these violences are interconnected and they're systemic and they're also interpersonal. Um, yeah, for sure. Are there any other thoughts on this? I'm trying to see the chat, which I'm not doing a very good job of like reading. Olga says, didn't act like a woman who was raped. Yeah, yeah, that's like so, so particularly violent um, on so many levels. Okay, so Kai Peterson, um, for the record, that for is that story is real, um, and I believe he was released in the past year. I might be wrong about that specifically. And in the notes that I, that I, we will send out after this, um, I will give you his information so you can find other ways to support and follow his work. He does a lot of really great work right now um, around supporting incarcerated survivors and really also like his own family. I also want to name that just because someone is released from prison doesn't mean that they are free from violence and free from being um, surveilled by the prison systems. Um, yeah, so thank you for doing that. Um, it is heavy, um, so I appreciate y'all like engaging with that content. I am now trying to share my presentation again. Okay, so this is Kai's story. Um, oop, that is way too far ahead. Yep. Okay, so I wanna give out y'all a little bit of context um, so that we can better understand the ways that survivors of sexual violence are criminalized for surviving. Um, can you see my whole screen right now? Or are there any like boxes that are blocking from seeing anything? Sometimes it happens. I wanna make sure that y'all can see it. It looks good, Nani. Okay, cool, thank you. All right, so our criminal legal system relies on a couple of assumptions that we hold as a society. So that one, we as a society tend to assume that crime is neutral, apolitical, and unconnected to oppression. Really in the past year, um, this has been interrogated and challenged, uh, which is great, but overall as a society, we tend to assume that crime is neutral and apolitical and unconnected to oppression. We also assume that survivors never commit crimes and are perfectly sympathetic. We're really gonna break down this assumption um, in this training today because who gets to be sympathetic and what happens when survivors of sexual violence do commit crimes? What is, does that mean that they're less deserving of our support? Um, and finally, uh, we assume that survivors want incarceration, deportation and punishment and that these things make the world safer. Mm -hmm. Survivors who are already criminalized for their race, class, work, and gender, and other types of categories are not perceived as being capable of being victims or are perceived as causing their own abuse. Um, 
if particularly if you're thinking about the realities of young black girls who are sexualized and adultified at a very young age, um, we're often seeing, and we'll see throughout this presentation that they are being seen as causing the violence or consenting to the violence that is happening to them. And we know that is not true. We know that survivors are never consenting to the violence that is happening to them. This is also particularly true of folks who do sex work or trans folks um, or other types uh, or other folks from other types of marginalized communities. So in order to understand the ways that survivors are criminalized, um, I have three framings to help us go through it. The trauma to prison pipeline, survived and punished, and what is happening in carceral facilities themselves. So the trauma to prison pipeline is a report written by the Human Rights Project, Georgetown Law Center, and Miss Foundation for Women. Um, and it's, they really looked at the ways that they, because mass incarceration is often focusing on men, they were they decided to question what's happening with girls. Um, and they found that um, for many survivors, particularly young girls, they are criminalized for the ways that they experience and navigate trauma and survival. And we know already that sexual violence is, is incredibly prevalent. We know that one in four girls and one in 13 boys experience sexual violence before they turn 18. And we know that nationally, almost half of females experience a rape in their lifetime when they're a child, first when they're a child. However, when we look at young people who are system involved, these uh, statistics jump up. We're seeing that, uh, and this also, all comes from the report. We're seeing that 31% uh, of girls in juvenile justice systems are sexually abused. 45% uh, have five or more adverse childhood experiences. For boys, that's seven and 24% respectively. However, and while these numbers are scary as is, we're seeing that um, when we look at more localized studies, and again, these stats are coming from the sexual abuse uh, to prison pipeline report, we're seeing that at local studies, these numbers are truly like astounding <laughs> that in South Carolina, 81% of girls in juvenile justice systems are victims of sexual abuse. In Oregon, that's 76%. As of now, Connecticut does not collect data on this. And if we're thinking about ways to intervene and interrupt um, the pipeline, the sexual violence to prison pipeline, one of the things that we can do is to get state support and state funding in order to conduct um, really robust data and research around this. So, what is the sexual abuse to prison pipeline? What it is is essentially saying that girls' common reactions to trauma are criminalized and exacerbated by involvement in the juvenile justice system, which leads to a cycle of abuse and imprisonment. So if we start um, with this pink stripe, right, sexual abuse, we, what we see is that when young people experience some sort of child abuse, child neglect, especially, especially sexual abuse, um, what that means is that they're experiencing trauma, but they're also experiencing um, unmet needs for safety, for human connection, for stability, for food, for housing, all those basic needs. Um, and like any other normal human being, um, if one is not having their needs met, they're going to try to make those needs met. So for example, if we think about a young person who's experiencing child sexual abuse at their home, which is a fairly common experience, it makes logical sense that they would run away from home. Um, they also might end up being chewing from school. They might end up stealing um, or selling sex or selling drugs. Um, they might end up uh, doing drugs in order to cope and they might end up um, even like uh, getting into a relationship of sorts with an older boyfriend and partner who promises them those needs of safety, human connection and so on. Um, and what happens is that all these behaviors are, are unfortunately um, criminalized behaviors. Uh, and so this child is now experiencing unaddressed trauma, mental and physical health issues, and they're having this reactive behavior here that is criminalized. So then they enter the juvenile justice system. And while they're in the juvenile justice system, none of these uh, trauma, uh, mental and physical health issues are being addressed in any way. So now the trauma symptoms get triggered, and then in some cases, there are new incidents of abuse. And then they're often released back into community, right? No one stays in juvenile justice systems forever. When they're released back into community, none of these issues have been addressed in any way. So they're, they, they are often returning back into um, 
abusive and violent uh, environments with exacerbated trauma symptoms. And then they have to do what they have to do to survive, right? So then they might return back to those trauma coping behaviors, which are criminalized behaviors, the stealing, the selling of the sex, the doing drugs, all of that in order to survive. And then a new arrest occurs, the cycle repeats and deepens and goes on and on and on and on. So that is the trauma to prison pipeline. Um, the second framing that we're gonna talk about here is the Survived and Punished model. Survived and Punished is a really, really amazing organization that a lot of this information is based off of. Um, they work in California, Chicago, and New York mostly, um, and they do some really incredible groundbreaking work around supporting survivors who are incarcerated for defending themselves. So we're gonna watch this video about Grisha Meadows. It's about two minutes. I'm gonna to try to make sure my sound and everything makes sense before I share it. Let me know if you can hear it. Grisha Meadows was 14 years old in July 2016 when she allegedly used the gun that her father had brandished for years against her and her family, terrorizing and abusing them to shoot him in his sleep. Brisha long learned to fear her father, who had repeatedly made threats to kill her and her family. The evidence of her father's abuse could be seen in police reports, orders of protection, faded bruises, stories from neighbors, and allegations of sexual violence. Brisha repeatedly sought help from family members, school staff, and police, but the violence continued. As a black girl with few options, she was rightly scared for her family members' lives as well as her own. After she killed her father, she was arrested and prosecutors refused to release Brisha while she awaited trial. The threat that she might be tried as an adult hung over her head until public pressure forced prosecutors to announce in December 2016 that she would be tried in juvenile court. On May 22, 2017, Brisha submitted to a plea deal that would keep her in juvenile detention for a full year, which includes 10 months of time served, an additional six months of confinement in a mental health treatment facility. During her months of detention, Brisha was put on suicide watch multiple times. Juvenile detention compounds trauma. It does not heal it. Brisha is just one of tens of thousands of incarcerated girls and young women across the United States. Understanding the details of how Brisha has been treated is instructive on how the criminal punishment system is a destructive force against children and youth, especially those who are Black. Brisha's family and legal team credit popular support in organizing for pushing the state to offer Brisha a plea that prevented her from spending many, many years behind bars. Learn more about other people who are criminalized for defending themselves to survive and about defense campaigns in support of them. Visit survivedandpunished.org. Um, trying to get out of this. Um, and I forgot to mention this earlier. Uh, feel free to ask any questions um, in the chat or anything and or have any comments or anything so that I can uh, answer them at the end of my little lecture right here. Um, one of the things that strikes me most about the survived and punished um, there, or specifically actually Brisha Meadows' story is that before she kills her father, pretty much all of her so, so, uh, support system and social networks know what's happening to her. Her friends know, her family knows, her neighbors know, her teachers know, doctors know, police officers know. Everyone is aware of what's happening, but they are unable to intervene in a real way to save Brisha and her family. And Brisha is moved by the desperate act of survival in, to not only just protect herself, but to protect her mother and protect her family. And then she is forced to kind of kill, not kind of, to force to kill her father. Um, and then as soon as she does that, there are systems that are engineered to criminalize her immediately, not just criminalize her, but criminalize her as an adult. Um, it was only due to public pressure that they were able to um, kind of whittle down her sentence and have them see her as a child and as a child who was needing of help. But yet she was still incarcerated, um, both in the carceral system and in the mental health institutions. Um, so I, for me, Brisha Meadows' story is an example of all the ways that we could actually build, thinking about all, 
all the things that happened before she killed her father, all that time and all those opportunities to intervene and actually protect her and her family. Um, and the last um, thing I want to have us focus on is what's happening in carceral facilities themselves. Oftentimes, uh, we are hoping that carceral facilities are places of rehabilitation and they provide people with needed mental health care. Unfortunately, um, it is widely known that sexual violence and other types of violence are, um, are occurring within prisons and within carceral facilities. And to give a little bit of context to this, uh, in Dee Farmer is a black trans woman who was placed in a men's prison. Um, I forget which state, to be honest, and I will go back and check that. Um, and she was subse subsequently raped while in prison. Her case made it up all the way to the Supreme Court, um, where in 1994, Justice David Souter declared that being violently assaulted in prisons is simply not part of the penalty that criminal offenders pay for their offenses against society. So we're seeing that like, it, there is a US Supreme Court ruling that says that sexual violence is not allowed nor acceptable within um, prisons. Um, though I would argue that on a social level, we don't treat prison sexual violence or prison rape as like a serious issue. If anything, actually we see in, in like TV shows and all of that, that is like something to laugh about, um, which is so harmful in so many different ways. Um, a couple years later, uh, the Prison Rape Elimination Act was passed. It's a federal act that uh, moves to make the Department of Corrections uh, more accountable to the sexual violence that happens within prisons. So it's a federal act, which I think is really important as well. Um, and it defines sexual violence and understands sexual violence as, as knowing that it can happen between incarcerated people, but also criminalizes all sexual contact between prison staff and people who are incarcerated. So a federal act, Priya, has recognized that there is no way that prison staff can have any kind of consensual sexual contact with people who are incarcerated. I also want to name that there is tension um, between bodily autonomy and what carceral facilities consider as security measures. So we understand sexual violence as incredibly, obviously incredibly harmful. Um, but one of the ways in which it is incredibly harmful is that it um, robs people of their agency, of their control over their body, their bodily autonomy, right? And part of the healing process for a lot of people is to regain that sense of control over their body. However, if you're incarcerated, you literally have no control over what is happening to you. Um, every part of what you're doing is being monitored. So where you go, where you sleep, what you wear, when, you go to this part of the facility, to the other part of the facility, um, when, when you take a shower, for how long, when you go outside, for how long, all of that is being heavily monitored and controlled, all under the um, idea of providing security. Particularly, um, there are other types of security measures that prisons do that are incredibly invasive and violent, like strip searches. Um, they're very normalized in, within prisons, um, seen as an acceptable thing to do, but if you are, even if you're not a survivor of sexual violence, having to go through a strip search is incredibly triggering and um, violent. Beth Ritchie is the author of Arrested Justice, um, which I highly recommend folks to read. Um, she says in her book, prisons also foster an atmosphere of sexual violence through security procedures. This emphasizes incarcerated survivors of their lack of power and ability to protect themselves from their supposed protectors. So these three framing is the trauma to prison pipeline, survive and punish, carceral facilities. All of this is really showing us that people specifically, I mean, particularly young people who are surviving sexual violence and also criminalized for it are made more vulnerable by becoming system involved. And I would like all of you just to take a second to think about when was the first time you learned the word consent um, or learned about boundaries and healthy relationship behaviors. For me, I didn't learn the word consent until I was 18 and going to college. Um, and I'm constantly learning about boundaries and healthy relationship behaviors every day. So as someone who's, who has experienced that and then is also working and thinking about people who are incarcerated and are survivors, I have to think about how, what does it mean to be separated from your community, from your family and placed under state supervision? And what does that do to 
your ideas of violence and relationships. Um, I used to work as a teacher, uh, as a, uh, a high school Quincy teacher for a system of all youth. And I think a lot of the ways that I understood relationships, I was really privileged to learn a lot of really healthy relationship mechanisms. And I saw that my students had very different ideas of it. Um, and it's something that I continue to return to as I do this work. Um, I wanna pause there and see if folks have any questions. And we'll take a sip of water. You can raise your hand if you have a question, you can type it into the chat. I'm also like almost done with water, so I don't want to like spill on myself. <laughs> That'd be embarrassing. Okay, we're gonna give it 10 more seconds. And I forgot to count. Okay, so we're just gonna go on to the next stuff. <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna do a similar exercise um, that we did with Kai's story. We're gonna do it now with um, May's story. Um, I would love to have, this is a lot to ask for, so I'm sorry. Can I have seven volunteers to read? And I will check the chat right now so I can see. I'll do it. Um, whoever just said, I'll do it, can you be narrator? Yep, so you want me to read May's story, right? Um, in one moment, let me, let's figure out everybody else who's gonna be reading as well so that we don't have to um, do it all together or maybe that'll make more sense, we'll see. I will, I'm typing out the rules, one, two. I can read. Okay. You need me to. Yes, I do not. Okay, so can the first person who volunteered, you can be narrator. Um, second person, you can be volunteer one. Third person, volunteer two. And we need four more people to be org one, two, three, and four. I'll be org one. Cool. Thank you, Lindsay. I do recognize your voice. You've got, <clears throat> you've got a volunteer, Ruth is going to volunteer to be org two. I can also volunteer to be org three. And then I can do org four. Cool. Um, whoever volunteered to be narrator, could you please read? Yes, this is Cindy. Um, cool. All right, May's story. May is a 50 year old Thai woman who came to the US to do sex work. She is a single domestic violence survivor who financially supports her family and was not able to find work in her home country that could sustain them. She only speaks Thai. Though she came to the US willingly to do sex work, she was tricked about her situation. She was not allowed to leave and had no freedom of movement and was forced to do sex work for little to no pay. After years of forced sexual labor and abuse, the FBI raided the house she stayed in, arresting everyone involved. May was also arrested and sent to pre-trial detention, and her bail was set to over $100,000. During court, her interpreter asked, why did you do this kind of work? You have a 20-year-old who studies for the police academy. Don't you understand how ashamed he would be if he knows that his mom does sex work? The federal government is charging her as an accomplice, accomplice to sex trafficking and for money laundering. That's all I see. I can't hear you, Nani. Eventually an advocate gets in touch with May and hears her story. May begins to trust the advocacy organization and with her permission, 
the organization advocates advocates for her to be released from pre-trial detention and request to be her bail obligor as an organization. The court eventually agrees, but only if she wears an ankle monitor and is kept under house arrest. May is not allowed to walk outside, even into the backyard without permission, nor is she allowed to use the phone or computer freely. Her case is kept very private within the organization due to legal issues. A member of the organization sees May's ankle monitor one day and tells May's advocate, why does May wear that? I need to know because I wasn't told that somebody like that would be here. I need to know for my safety. Another person knows that May has been has pending legal issues, but doesn't know much about her case. She says to a staff member, I can't support her depending on the nature of the crime. Over the course of a year, May is able to gain more freedoms with the support of her advocate. At this point, it is time for her to move into more long term housing. May's advocate makes calls to other anti-violence organizations to try to find her some options. Eventually, an advocate gets in oh, touch with sorry. May. I think I went backwards, my bad. Sorry, Arg one. Another organization says, we don't have any staff that speak her language. And if she comes here, will she agree to follow all our rules? We don't really have capacity to support someone in this kind of situation. We don't do legal work. Another organization says, well, she obviously made big mistakes. If we take her in, how do we know she won't do something stupid again? What if she sneaks out to do sex work at night instead of eating, sorry, abiding by curfew? Yeah, another organization says, we have a really good relationship with the prosecutors on this case and don't want to step on any toes with them. One organization says to May's advocate, she knowingly came to the U.S. to do sex work. Our grant requires her to be a real victim of trafficking. We can't let her in. Okay. So we're going to do breakout rooms and we're going to do the Jamboard activity. So I'm going to drop it into the chat and I'll explain what we're going to do in just a moment. So it makes a little bit more sense. Copy link. Uh, okay. Everyone should be able to access that uh, Jamboard. If you flip to the second page, you'll see a very similar thing. It says May instead of Kai. And you're gonna answer the same questions. What violences is May experiencing and where are these violences coming from? We're gonna split y'all into groups of like, let's do groups of six. That's an odd number. Let's do groups of five then. Y'all are gonna get real comfy with each other. Um, so Kelsey, why hopefully can you do that? Thank you so much. Um, okay, so we're all gonna be split into groups of five, which means I think that means we're gonna be having eight groups if I know my math. Um, you're gonna do the same thing where you're gonna answer what violences is me experiencing. You can think barriers, bias, and isms, and then answer where are these violences coming from. Um, you're also going to answer the third page, which is what kinds of support may, may need. Um, you're going to have about 20-ish minutes to do this. I'll come into every room. You're going to have, so that means you have about like seven-ish minutes to talk about, talk through each question. Um, I think that should make sense. How do, do people have any questions, concerns, feelings, thoughts, dreams? We're almost ready. Let's go. Cool. Also, people can share their dreams. I'm okay with that. It's a heavy, nothing that we say here. It's like super light. So, you know, you can share some positivity. Thank you, Pamela, for being part of this conversation. And like, that's awesome that you wanted to be part of this while in an airport. Okay, I think we are good to go. Um, how long do you want the rooms to go for? 
Let's say, we'll say 20, but I'll come and check in for folks. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to set it um, to close after 19, and then you get the extra 60 seconds, so that'll be 20, but we can close them earlier if we, if we need to. Um, could we pause the recording on this for now? Welcome back, everybody. Did I lose my my people? My people. Yeah, we're all back in the main room. Okay. <laughs> Hi everybody. Um, I made it to two rooms and <laughs> jumped into the third, and then was we were all kicked out at the same time. Um, I am going to try to share my screen again. Um, sure. That. Cool. Are we seeing that the Jamboard? Yep. Awesome. Um, how does this go for everybody? That's great. Good. Good. Awesome. I'm also just trying to sh fix my view so I can see as many people as possible. Okay, so. This is amazing. I was like watching this and I'm really glad. Uh, it seemed like it could have been a lot more chaotic because so many people were working on this at the same time, but it seemed like it was okay. Um, so shout out to all of you. <laughs> this could have been really stressful. Um, what are some things that are sticking out for folks right now um, that we're, now that we're looking at the Jamboard together? You can share out loud, you can raise your hand, you can put in the chat, whatever feels best for you. Oh, I think well, uh, Hi, it's Cindy. I um I just wanna I that's why I asked, am I still in with my group, Jessica and um Jasmine? Um what struck me after I got out of the room was that we are talking about everyone's bias uh, in terms of agencies or support that was given. Like, she, you know, this one didn't want to work with her because she had an ankle bracelet on. This one didn't want to do that. And I'm thinking we need to do some, um, you know, we've got to develop a new culture because kindness and compassion matters. And for those of us that are in these positions, that is just unacceptable. So I, I don't know if they're employed or unemployed people that were rejecting May out of turn, but um, to me, it's a larger cultural issue. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, actually, I'll hold on to my thought until I think I heard somebody else also try to speak up. Maybe not, but in my conversation with Alyssa, we talked a little bit about um, Risha Meadows, and I went to a training yesterday where they talked a lot about Risha Meadows. Um, one of the things that happened with her case was that they, it, it received, start, started to receive national attention in different groups all over the country, and folks wanted to organize and, like, support her, and they, they were like, okay, so where are the Ohio folks? Where is the Ohio um, anti-SV, anti-DD folks? Where are they? They called them up, and then the organization said, we don't support cases like this. Um, which is heartbreaking. And one of the things that Alyssa did a really great job of like naming was that there, the limitations of organizations can be violence in itself. We saw that with the different, with the scripts that the organization said, that the volunteers said, that the, they, they were like, our grant doesn't fund this kind of work. We only fund, we only support real victims of trafficking. That, that is violence um, to do that for sure. 
What are, actually, I think I saw something in the chat. Um, dehumanization of mothers, can someone expand on this? Yeah, I don't, I, that also stuck out for me. I don't know who said that, I would love to hear more. So that was, that was our group. And Lucy mentioned that if it had been, you know, a father or a man, then they wouldn't have said like, oh, your kids would be so ashamed of you. Your son is training, you know, to kind of take her out of her role as an independent person and just to make her, you know, Chad's mom or whoever, um, and kind of put that extra shame on her in addition to whatever she was facing. Yeah, thank you. That is entirely true. I did not think about that. What are other things that are coming up for folks as we're looking at this? For me, when I look at this, I'm seeing a lot of the ways that organizations that exist to help can actually hurt because we put our, our finances are so tightly tied to politics um, mm -hmm. that it's often written into our that we can't serve particular types of people or people who have certain backgrounds. Um, and then we end up just kind of passing survivors around to other organizations who have the same grant limitations that we do. And, and we, miss, we miss a lot of folks that way because we cater to like perfect victims even when we don't want to as service providers. Thank you for saying that. Um, I imagine that is, especially for advocates across the coalition, that might be like extremely frustrating experience to know that like you're trying to help a survivor, but grants say no. Um, and thank you also for naming the perfect survivor myth. Um, Clarissa says, even the way DCF um, cases are handled when a woman, when women, when a woman is experiencing um, intimate per partner violence, instead of getting them help, they remove the kids. A lot of things still need great change and it's unfortunate. Yeah, that is like a very big issue. Um, it, maybe this also is tying into the dehumanization of mothers part where um, if the mother is also facing abuse, they are still held responsible and then they can lose their children. And in a way we're still seeing this like, instead of like with the Risha Meadow story, instead of like, all there's all these opportunities for support to happen and care and all of this stuff. But instead we're, our, a lot of our social systems are set up to punish, to isolate, to abandon, to put in a prison, um, to re-victimize, yeah. Thank you for naming that. I think one of the things here too was that she was protecting her children, right? It's the same thing when the DV victim, right? A woman whose kids are taken away, she, she doesn't do something because she's protecting her children and then she gets blamed for that. Um, yeah. and it, one of the things so we sort of at the end, we sort of talked about treating victims as commodities. That's what it seemed like a little bit in all of these. Everybody, she, the person wasn't necessarily a person, but what to do with her. Mm. Oh. Ugh. Depersonalizing her. So it's sort yes. of this, the same thing, but as a victim. Uh, it's like so sad because like we all do this work because we want the world to be a better place. And then we are forced to kind of like process everybody and then that is a act of dehumanization that is violence on itself yeah yeah but Especially even the criminal because... justice system too sorry sorry Lindsay oh sorry Lindsay um I was just gonna say especially because in general, like every time an organization interacts with her, then that counts as an intake for them or whatever they count as an intake. So that like you're using the fact that she called you looking for help to get grant funding, even though the funding is what is preventing you from helping her and then passing her on to another organization who can then add her as an intake and then not be able to help her. So that definitely turns her into a commodity. Yeah, oh my God. Um, Someone here wrote, I can't find it right now, but someone wrote nonprofit industrial complex. And I think that's kind of what you're naming here. There's a, there's some book about like, or some, I forget what exact title is, but it's like liberation will not be funded by nonprofits or something like that. I forget what exactly it is, but um, I will find the book and we will all read it together eventually one day. Um, are there other stuff that's like, uh, that is coming up for folks?
Um, there's some, Nani, there's some other stuff in the chat too, just um, that a lot of people in the criminal justice system and DCF system are burnt out and they literally treat everyone as a number with no emotion really. Um, and that um, in agencies, there's issues with down staff or shifting of caseload and that re-victimizes people. Yeah, I am connecting a lot to what you're saying, Nicole, about the re because people just get passed along. Um, I found that when I was teaching in New York, I my students would like open up about their trauma to me, but they were so desensitized from it. They were like, yep, this is it. And they because that was just the other person that they would they had to talk to. And I was like, I hate this so much because like you're clearly not getting what you need and you keep telling people and it's not. You're just like, you You are also like dissociating from this. Um, it was common across the board. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to just move on to maybe some more creative, like if we lived in a different world, what, what would that look like? Um, well, okay, like specifically, what kinds of support might may need? So I see that y'all are saying removal of ankle monitor. Yeah, the I also noticed in the one before someone said the the kind of like stigma that the volunteer had and was like, I, don't, I need to know what she did um, is for my own safety. Yeah. Um, tapped into local services, language classes, employment opportunities, women support groups, housing, et cetera, basic communication needs, phone and internet. Is really, that's really poignant. Um, culturally competent support and understanding, understanding of immigration and history, definitely. Uh, a advocate who specializes and understands the way that sex trafficking works, immigration and language support, education, legal advocacy. What other types of support might may need? Or if anyone has thoughts about the ones that are on the board right now. I think access to a support network of other people who faced the same difficulty she's facing so she can build community with them. It's both similar to one. Sorry. Uh, and then family support, since that's been taken away from her. I think also because like, people have talked a lot about moms, maybe like specifically being able to talk to other moms who are dealing with this kind of situation. So it's going off of what Lindsay said, but like, um, there are a couple of organizations across the country that are organized around moms, like United Against Violence and that sort of thing. And I think those, those are super powerful. Um, I think I cut somebody off, I might have, I'm not sure. Oh, that was me. I was talking about English as a second language classes because mm -hmm. she's in so much in the dark based on her culture, her language. I would also add then maybe someone who on, instead of having folks like learn a whole other language, maybe also having advocates who can't speak Thai, who would understand your situation. So like culturally, informed um, advocates who can speak the language. Yeah, Nani, um, my group was the one um, that discussed the cultural competency. Um, and that's where, that's where we were coming from, is understanding that one, this is a whole nother culture that she's a part of. And that also has to do with the, demoni the demonizing of motherhood, because that is very different in that culture. Mm -hmm. um, and again, with the language, how you mentioned, you know, expecting someone to learn a new language just so they wouldn't be in trouble um, is, is a violence itself. So I think really being informed on cultures and not only informed, but being competent in how to assist a variety of cultures so that way these violences don't continue to occur, I think is very important. 
Well, I'm wondering, you guys are victim informed advocates, many of you on this call. Did anyone say, let's ask the quote unquote victim, let's ask May what she needs or what she wants? I think that's an important thing to even just be able to ask. Like, yeah, what is asking May what she needs? And if you give her choices and options to help her along, then she can make, you know, wise choices for herself, hopefully. She can decide if she wants to learn English or do this, be retrained for a different kind of job. Absolutely, Cindy. And I think an important part of that is making sure though that people are culturally informed so that can happen. Because if, if people are not culturally competent or informed, or if no one can communicate with her, that piece can't happen. So I think that's a really good point of how to bridge the two pieces to make yep. sure that the violence in the systems um, don't keep coinciding. Thanks, Olga. Something around culturally informed, uh, trauma informed, and uh, survivor centered. I think that's what I'm picking up from what we're saying. Thank you. I think that's so important. I think there's such a like lack of like we have so many different types of services across the state and people are skilled in different things. Go ahead, Kelsey. I was just gonna say in the chat, there's also um, Clarissa sort of making the same point about um, that just many of the like systems that we were talking about on the previous page are not culturally aware, you know, whatever language you wanna use. Um, and so that that's a problem. And then we also have in the chat that uh, May might need adequate mental health care given all the trauma that she's experienced. sure i think another thing she needs is, is money yeah. <laughs> that was the first thing i was like yeah she's just this like yeah i can go on a whole thing about capitalism on it but i'm not going to um but like money like people just need money and that's why we people are placed i mean Lindsay used to sorry maybe i shouldn't be saying this but Lindsay used to be like the housing specialist and we we had a couple conversations around like basic needs a lot of what's being like on this page right now is like basic needs are not being met right so like if people have money if people have just like the basic stuff then we can go on to the healing processes thank you for saying that Lindsay I was just sitting on that for a while <laughs> I probably wasn't going to say anything so thank you for saying that um also I just wanted to point out that you know some things that are um like for example a lot of people that are uh, I'm Hispanic I'm, my family's from Puerto Rico um, a lot of behaviors that are acceptable over there are not acceptable over here. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess that does fall under like cultural, right? I guess. Um, but I feel like if, you know, educating them more to like their their rights, I mean, also like what they can and can't do would, would be very helpful um, because I do know a lot of Hispanics that have fallen in prison, you know, because they're unaware that what you do over there, you can't do over here. Yeah. I know this is reading comprehension 101, but we were trying to figure out where the son who was becoming a police officer, was he back in Thailand or was he here? I agree. I took this, um, the um, story from the curriculum and I didn't, I was also confused to be honest. Um, and I didn't, and all of this is based off of real stories. So I didn't want to add a detail in it that might not be true. So I don't know. Um, we thought that may well i thought and i think others concurred that you know maybe they would need family therapy to get them through this together and 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 she and if she had her son here should go together yeah um i'm gonna flip to the next page um, and a lot of you have already named this, but let's just get it on the board. Um, this is helpful also because like, these are things that we can come back to. So once it's written down, we can think about the ways that we function as anti-SB or anti-DB organizations or whatnot, or other types of advocacy organizations. Um, so what barriers and tensions might anti-sexual violence organizations encounter when trying to support incarcerated or otherwise system impacted or criminalized survivors? Well, you know, a comment I have about that, we only know the obvious ones. 
there are a lot of um, survivors that we don't know who are incarcerated. So lack of knowledge over who incarcerated survivors are. Right. And it has to do with the ACE score and, you know, whether they were harmed as children or harmed as adults or harmed in that prison. So maybe like access slash uh, supportive environments where people can disclose. Wait, sorry, I'm doing the, the opposite of what I'm trying to do, sorry. Um, I'm trying to find barriers, but this is also important, so. Um, in, the, um, in the chat, you have, uh, Clarissa kind of said the same, the same thing, just that um, many people stay quiet or, you know, many people don't disclose that they're a survivor. Um, and then Gina said harsh judgment is another barrier. Stigma, judgment. There's also um, sometimes the, the especially if someone is incarcerated, the prison system will actively work to keep advocates from accessing their clients. Um, I'm gonna repeat what Alyssa said earlier about the ways that the limitations of grants and nonprofits um, are in itself a barrier. Would love like two more at least. Um, and then in the chat, there's um, a comment about how the the prisons sometimes have the sexual assault crisis number posted on the wall. And then I think in response to that, somebody said, um, even if access is granted, lack of truly confidential communication is a barrier. And I know that's something that you, Nani, you all have been talking about um, in terms of helping folks who are incarcerated get access to the services that are being offered. Yeah, I was gonna say, even when, even when people do report, so use the PREA hotline or complain to a counselor, um, they still face sometimes like being in, um, what is the word for when you are alone? Solitary. My mind just blanked off. Solitary. Thank you. Solitary. They are placed in solitary confinement or sometimes moved away from their friends or have their stuff tossed um, as it's like punishment for coming forward. You know, somebody earlier spoke about um, strip searches in the prisons, and I don't know when, but several, maybe longer years back, they um, supposedly dismantled, it is against the law to um, do an invasive cavity search in prison. And yet, I know they still do them. They may not do them all the time. And then if somebody comes forward, he gets in trouble to say, you know, you're not supposed to do that. You're harming that person. And they sweep it under the rug. Yeah. That is a sexual assault, by the way. One I think of we can all the, agree to it. One of the um, intern, oh, sorry. I was also looking at the chat really quick, but one of the PREA coordinators, I think in the Nevada region um, that I was speaking with, she had said that they were trying to do counseling with survivors at a certain prison and then, but the part, the prison kept doing strip searches for the survivors who were trying to meet with the counselors um, or not the counselors, the, the anti-SV advocates. And then they kept, you know, arguing with the prison like, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. They refused to do, to stop doing it. So then they were like, we can't actually offer the service anymore. And when they do the pre audit, they're going to say like, we stopped doing this because they refused to stop doing strip searches for survivors who are coming forward. Um, so, I mean, we will find out like what happens then, but, uh, yeah, 100% stretch are, uh, incredibly violent thing to be doing to folks. You're a survivor or not. Yeah. Also when, um, when folks who are incarcerated 
go to the hospital for evidence collection exams, um, they usually have a corrections officer in the room with them. So if a corrections officer was the person who assaulted them, their friend is basically there with them throughout the, the examination process. Oh. One of the, just because all this is really heavy, I want us to think a little bit about what a better world might look like. Um, what might the world look like if we didn't criminalize survival action? So think about Kai Peterson, Risha Meadows, um, and May, who were criminalized because they were doing things to help themselves survive. Um, what it might have looked like if we gave people the support they needed to live safer and happier lives? What, what would have happened to Risha Meadows if the anti-SV organization actually did support her or if the doctors uh, actually did support her or her teachers like stepped in. Um, at one point in her survival tactics, she had run away from home to live with her aunt and the police officers came and they told her that she had to go back home. Um, that was one of the like things that she tried to do. So um, in light of that, what literally like what might the world look like? What might change in our worlds? Um, we so really, uh, Nani, how many systems were broken there? How many systems actually failed her? So one thing is we should be shutting down completely juvenile detention centers. The girls should have never been criminalized and never incarcerated. Um, and I think a lot of this, like while you're emphasizing survivors, I'm telling you, there are it's survivors throughout the, the, the prison system that we're not identifying. And I look forward to a kinder, gentler world where we understand that all of them, it, most of them, if not all of them, come from a, um, they were survivors of something bad in their lives. Doesn't explain or justify but it gives us reason to restore. I mean, what we're saying with uh, um, the stats, right? Uh, in like the, I forget it was South Carolina, like 80% of the girls in, this, in juvenile systems there are survivors. So that, that is actually what we're saying, that survivors are the ones who are getting criminalized. I see that there are, maybe I saw something in the chat, I'm not sure. Um, Less violence. Actually, Kelsey, can you read that out for me? So I can. Yep. Um, yeah, less violence um, gives kids more trust to between human to human. Um, I do not agree, though, that all children could be rehabilitated. Um, and there is a there was sort of a, a string of comments a little bit up to about um, when I think when we were talking about some of the like processes or protocols within um the prisons that um there somebody here was saying that some of the stuff we were saying wasn't accurate so i don't know if uh <laughs> we want to talk about that more but that's up there too we, we only have a couple minutes left i'll go back and like look at the chat and we can send out a note later um there is a lot of discrep discrepancy between prisons and what is happening what doesn't happen what is allowed what's not allowed um and that changes like county to county, prison to prison, state to state. Um, so well, sure. you all know that in uh, at California, the study was that 70% of people 25 and under came from the system. We know the systems aren't working. And so um, again, it, it, it's mitigating. It's, they deserve more than we've given them. We failed, the systems failed so many of these people. Um, so there is something that I would encourage you all to look up, the Compassionate Prison Project. I'll definitely look it up. Um, I'm wondering if we can flip the script a little bit and think a little bit more about like, what might a world that is, uh, that doesn't criminalize survival actions, what does a world like that look like? So we said there would be less violence overall, more trust with kids, GIJ centers wouldn't exist. I think we would have more um, like intact families, like, you know, everyone who is a part of a family would get to remain with their family and 
we wouldn't have all of the like the trauma that then stems from like folks being separated from their families. Mm -hmm. What does prevention look like? So we're we're not always um, you know downstream with resources and money. What does prevention look like if we got to really reduce the violence rather than answering violence with violence by incarceration? I think there would be um, an equitable education system. Mm -hmm. For sure. I also think like with all of these things, there would just be less poverty. Yeah. Maybe even just like no poverty. I'm just gonna go ahead and say that. You're um, right. <laughs> let's, let's, let's dream the world that we want. Basic needs are met always. We've got in the chat that um, less children would fall into the school to prison pipeline as well. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna dream big of no school to prison pipeline. I, I say this every, I try to like ask, ask this question a lot in my trainings. And my answer for this is always because I'm a terrible driver, uh, free and accessible transportation. I truly believe that will change the world um, in so many ways. I'm like not really fully really joking about that. Um, I've also thinking, been thinking about, I think in the past couple of days, just thinking about relationships with um, the land and nature and thinking about like having part of like having healthy relationships with each other is also having a healthy relationship um, with our environment. Um, is there anything else in the chat? I should. Um, just someone agreeing that free transportation is a, is a big issue. Okay. Whoever said that, you are my best friend. <laughs> Shout out. Um, uh, universal access to housing and food. That makes sense. I probably should have said that too. <laughs> Purely selfish is <laughs> what I'm talking about. Uh, access to housing and food, for sure. Um, okay, I, we're gonna just close out with a couple of more slides and then you'll, we'll, I'll be here for a couple more minutes in case anyone has any concerns or anything like that. If I can, nope, you guys are probably just saying yourselves. That's not what I want. Okay, so uh, we did a breakout rooms. We answered these questions. Um, here's a couple of values that I, if, we went through a lot today. Um, if you're gonna walk away with anything, walk away with these things, um, that one, there are no perfect victims or survivors. And that in fact, we're seeing that when survivors are in extremely violent circumstances, that they sometimes do violent things in order to survive. Um, and just because someone is doing something violent in order to survive, doesn't mean that they are less uh, deserving of our support and our sympathy um, and whatever other resources uh, we can provide them with. We can't assume that the legal system is always identifying situations and the people within them correctly or ethically. Um, this is particularly like thinking about uh, Brescia Meadows, um, Kai Peterson in May. Um, and similarly with the last point, uh, not all laws are just. We have a responsibility to support survivors against abuses of power, even when the legal system is involved in prosecuting them. And again, all of this is really heavy and I apologize for giving you all like a lot of heavy material, but I'm also really appreciative that we've all been able to like work through it together. Um, no one does this work knowing, knowing how to do it perfectly from the start. However, together we're, we're coming from different fields and different types of skill sets. So we do have many of the skills that we need already to do this work. And while we don't all have all of the answers, we have a lot to share and learn from each other, which I hope we got to do today um, in our small groups. And I, we obviously did that together in our larger groups. And I hope that we continue to do that. Um, that's really all I have for all of you. Um, my name is Dani, I use the ancient pronouns. That's my email. Um, all the organizations that you see right there, all those leaders, those are the people that I'm constantly learning from. So if um, I honestly just like follow them on social media, follow their newsletters, whatever it is, buy their books if that's something that you do or their podcasts or whatever it is. Um, those are like my, like just stones, my heroes that I'm constantly learning from.
So that's all I have. Thank you all. Um, I'll stay here for a couple more minutes and I hope you all get some water, relax, uh, take a nap. Work isn't real. It is, but it's not. Go, go do whatever you need to do. Thank you. <laughs>